Hey everyone, welcome to another deep dive. This time we're taking a look at how those massive online worlds we love are made. That's right, multiplayer game development. Exactly. It's a huge topic, everything from networking to matchmaking and how devs keep you playing for hours on end. It really is fascinating when you get into it. No doubt. And we're going to break it all down. Yeah, without getting bogged down in all the super technical details. Exactly. You'll come away from this deep dive. With a solid understanding. Of just what goes into making these games. Multiplayer games are all about creating these shared experiences. For players all over the world, right? Yeah. Think about when you're playing a game like, oh, Fortnite. Or something like League of Legends. Right. You're connected with people all over the globe. Yeah. It's wild when you think about it. It is. And there's so much that goes into making that work. So what are the like the absolute essentials? When it comes to building a multiplayer game. Yeah. What are the core things? I'd say the three key concepts are networking architecture, synchronization, uh -huh. and matchmaking. Gotcha. And without those... You wouldn't have those smooth, interconnected worlds we've all come to expect. Right, right. So let's start with networking architecture. Sure. What exactly is that? Like how games communicate with each other? That's it. It's the backbone that lets players connect and interact in the same game world. Okay. There are two main models, peer-to-peer -peer or PDP. Okay. And client server. All right. So PDP, that sounds familiar. You probably remember it from older games, like the original StarCraft. Oh, yeah, or early Halo games. Exactly. Each player's computer acted as both a client and a server. Oh, so they were sharing information directly. Yep. But that model had some drawbacks. Yeah, wasn't P2P known for that host advantage? Oh, for sure. Were the player hosting the game? They always had a slight edge. Yep, because they had lower latency. Ugh. So frustrating when you weren't the host. Yeah, that's one reason why client-server models have become so popular. Especially for the bigger games like Apex Legends or Valor. Exactly. In these games, all players connect to a central server. Oh, I see. So it's like the server acts as a referee. That's a great way to put it. Making sure everyone has a similar experience. No matter how good their connection is. That makes a lot more sense. It's much fairer that way. But even with a central server, there's still the issue of lag, right? Oh, absolutely. Lag is the eternal enemy. So how do devs tackle that? To make sure everything runs smoothly. Yeah, how do they keep things in sync? That's where synchronization comes in. Oh, okay. It's a constant challenge for developers, for sure. But they have to make sure that everyone's experience is as similar as possible. Even with those network delays and hiccups and stuff. Exactly. Think of it like uh, like trying to conduct an orchestra I... where every instrument needs to be perfectly timed, even if some musicians are further away. Wow, that's a great analogy. It really is a delicate balancing act. So how do they actually pull that off? How do they make it work? Well, one trick is client-side prediction. Client-side prediction. What's that? So when you do something in the game, like shooting a weapon, oh. your client basically predicts what should happen and shows it to you right away. Oh. Well. Then the server checks if you are right. Interesting. And if not, it makes some small corrections. So it's like the game is taking an educated guess. Yeah. And then adjusting if it's wrong. Gotcha. But what if that correction comes too late? Oh. And you've already acted based on what you saw. Yeah, that can be a problem. Doesn't that lead to, like, rubber banding? It does. Where your character jumps back to where they were a second ago. Right. That's one of the challenges with client-side prediction. Makes sense. Those discrepancies between what the player sees and what's happening on the server, yeah. they can lead to those frustrating rubber banding issues. It's like a constant tug of war between yeah. what you see. And what's actually happening. Exactly. So... Are there other techniques they use? To keep everything in sync. Yeah, how else do they do it? Another big one is lag compensation. Lag compensation, okay. Think of it like, hmm, like a time-traveling referee in a really fast-paced sport. Yeah, I like that. So the server basically rewinds the game a little bit. Okay. To account for the delay. Gotcha. And then sees if an action, like say a shot in Call of Duty, uh -huh. would connect it if there was no lag. Whoa, so the server is a time traveler. Just keep things fair. That's wild. But I've heard lag compensation can sometimes create that peaker's advantage, right? You're right. It... Where players with higher latency can actually exploit the system. It's true. Lag compensation isn't perfect. Right. And it can lead to some unintended advantages. Makes sense. It's a big debate in the gaming community. Because devs are constantly trying to strike that balance between fairness and responsiveness. It sounds like synchronization is just a constant balancing act. It really is. All right, so we've got networking architecture right. and synchronization down. So what about matchmaking? Good question. How do devs make sure that players are matched up fairly? 
You mean in a way that makes the game fun for everyone. Exactly. That's where matchmaking systems come in. Yeah. And they're way more complex than most people think. Really? They take a lot of things into account. Because no one wants to get constantly destroyed by players who are way better. Exactly. Or be stuck in games that are just totally one-sided. Right. Right. So the most common way to do this is with a skill rating system. Okay. Like ELO or MMR. Those sound familiar. These systems rank players based on how they've done in past games. Gotcha. So it's all about trying to match players with others of similar skill levels. That's the idea. To make sure everyone has a chance to win. Exactly. It's like those ranking systems in Rocket League or League of Legends. Right, right. So it's always adjusting based on your wins and losses. It is, but skill rating isn't the only thing. Oh, what else is there? Well, matchmaking systems also have to consider things like latency oh. and region. You wouldn't want to be matched with someone on the other side of the world. No way. Uh, yeah. The lag would be terrible. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to play. So it's about finding that sweet spot between skill and connection. I see. Makes sense. But there's even more. Huh. What else? Some games, like Overwatch, let players pick their preferred roles. Oh. Like tank, healer, or damage dealer. Oh, right. And the matchmaking tries to build balanced teams <laughs> with all the roles. So it's not just about throwing players together randomly. Not at all. It's about making a more tailored experience. Based on what players want. I'm starting to see how much goes into matchmaking. Oh, yeah. It's way more than I ever realized. It's all about keeping players happy and coming back for more. Exactly. And speaking of keeping players engaged. That's the real challenge. I think it's time to talk about the holy grail of game dev player retention. It's a key to a successful game. What are some strategies devs use to keep players hooked? It's all about making an experience that's not just fun, but truly engaging. Right. It has to keep players invested for the long haul. Exactly. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution. I bet. So what are some of the, like, tricks of the trade? One of the best techniques is a strong progression system. Okay. Whether it's leveling up, unlocking new abilities, or earning rewards, mm -hmm. that sense of progression keeps players motivated to keep playing. Yeah, there's nothing better than watching your character get stronger. Absolutely. And getting all that cool new gear. It's so satisfying. Games like Call of Duty do this really well with their battle passes. Oh yeah, those are great. You complete challenges, level up the pass, and get all kinds of reward. It keeps you coming back for more. That's the idea. But progression is just one part of it, right? It is. Devs also need to keep things fresh with new content. Makes sense. You don't want the game to get stale. Exactly. New maps, characters, game modes, even cosmetic items can make a big difference. Games like Fortnite and Apex are really good at that. They're the masters. Always dropping new seasons and events to keep players on their toes. That constant surprise keeps people coming back. I see. But it's not just about the content itself. It's also about the community, right? You got it. Fostering social interaction is huge for player retention. Think about games like Destiny 2 or World of Warcraft. Huge communities. They live and breathe on those social connections. Clans, guilds, in-game chat, teaming up with friends. It all adds to that sense of belonging. And when players feel connected to a community... They stick around. Exactly. So we've got progression systems, uh, updates, social features. That's a lot to juggle. Are there any other strategies devs use? Oh, they have tons of tricks up their sleeves. Like what? Offering incentives for returning players is another good one. Okay. Things like daily login rewards. Oh, yeah. Or special events with unique loot. It's all about giving players a reason to come back. Even if it's just for a little bit. Like those daily quests in Genshin Impact. Yep. Those are great at getting people to log in every day. It's all about establishing that routine. And rewarding players for being loyal. Right. But at the end of the day... What's the most important thing? A balanced gameplay experience. That's crucial. If a game feels unfair or unbalanced... Ugh, it's so frustrating. Players will just quit. Right. Especially if it feels like you're always at a disadvantage. Exactly. Devs need to make sure that Every player has a fair shot at winning. No matter their play style or skill level. It's essential for keeping a healthy and engaged player base. It sounds like a never-ending process. It is, especially in those games with complex mechanics. Right, and tons of characters and items. But it's worth it. I bet it's all about creating a game that people love to play. A game that's both fun and challenging. And fair. Absolutely. We've covered so much already. We have. It's clear that making a multiplayer game is no easy feat. It's definitely a challenge. But it's also incredibly rewarding when you get it right. Seeing players connect and enjoy the game you created.
There's nothing like it. It's the best feeling. Before we move on, I want to tap into our creative sides a bit. Okay. Imagine you're designing a multiplayer game. What's that one feature you would add to keep players coming back? Ooh, that's a tough one. What would make your game stand out? Hmm. I'd have to think about that. Well, we'll dive into those possibilities in the next part of our deep dive. Sounds good. We'll explore some of the latest trends cool. and brainstorm some ideas that could completely change how we play. I can't wait. Until then, keep those creative juices flowing and get ready to unleash your inner game designer. That's a great idea. We'll catch you in the next part of the deep dive. See you then. Welcome back. Last time, we were talking about creating truly memorable gaming experiences. Yeah, those games that keep you coming back for more. Exactly. And I think one of the most exciting things is emergent gameplay. It sounds futuristic, doesn't it? Like something out of a sci-fi movie? It kind of is, but it's happening right now in some of the biggest games. So what is it exactly? It's about creating these systems that can lead to totally unexpected outcomes. Okay. Based on how players interact with each other uh -huh. and the game world. So it's not just about following a set path or story. Nope. It's about giving players the freedom to shape the game world and create their own narratives. Oh, I see. Think of a game like Minecraft. The mechanics are pretty basic. Right. But what players can do is practically limitless. Yeah, you can build almost anything you can imagine. Exactly. You can create your own world, societies, even economies. Like the game becomes this living, breathing thing. It really does. That changes based on what players do. That's emergent gameplay in a nutshell. But I imagine that kind of freedom requires a lot of careful planning from the devs. For sure, you can't just let things run wild. Right, so how do they strike that balance? Between giving players freedom and making sure the game doesn't become chaotic. Yeah. It's like being a gardener, you plant the seeds and nurture the environment, That's but tough. you have to let nature take its course and see what grows. That's a good way to think about it. So when it comes to designing for emergent gameplay, yeah. there are a few key things devs need to consider. Oh. Well, first off, player agency is huge. Okay. Players need to feel like their choices matter. Right, like they're actually having an impact on the world. Exactly. Otherwise, they won't be invested in the outcome. It's like the difference between watching a movie and actually being a character in it. That's a great way to put it. So player agency is one thing. What else? What other things are important? Another crucial thing is system complexity. Okay. The systems in the game need to be intricate enough to allow for all sorts of possibilities. Right, so there's enough depth to keep things interesting. Exactly. But they can't be so complex that players get overwhelmed. Makes sense. It's all about finding that sweet spot. Where the complexity adds depth without being a barrier. Right, so it's a balancing act for sure. It really is. But when devs nail it... What happens? The results can be amazing. Players come up with these incredible things. Things that even the devs couldn't have predicted. Exactly. It's like the game takes on a life of its own. That's the beauty of emergent gameplay. So we've talked about the philosophy behind it. The design side of things. But what about the tech? What kind of tech is shaping the future of these games? Oh, there are so many exciting developments happening right now. Like what? Well, one that's really caught my eye is cloud gaming. Cloud gaming? That's where games are streamed over the internet, right? Yep. Just like how we stream movies and music. Right, so no more needing a powerful PC or console. Exactly. You could theoretically play any game on almost any device. That's pretty revolutionary. It makes gaming accessible to so many more people. But what about latency and input lag? Ah, the eternal enemies of online gaming. Aren't those problems with streaming? They can be, but with the advancements in networking tech. Like 5G. Exactly. Streaming quality is getting better and better. So the tech is catching up. It is, but there will always be some limitations. Right, but even with those limitations, the possibilities are huge. Imagine playing a massive online game on your phone. Seamlessly switching between devices. It could change everything. Cloud gaming is definitely the future. I think so. What else is on the horizon? Another area that's really exciting is AI. Artificial intelligence. Yep. We're already seeing it used in games. To make the NPCs more realistic. Right. But it can do so much more. Oh, like what? Imagine AI that can learn and adapt to how you play. In real time. Exactly. Creating these personalized challenges. Whoa. So the game would be different for every player. In a way, yes. It would be like having a personal game master tailoring the experience just for you. That's incredible. Are we seeing any of that today? We are. Games like Fortnite and Destiny 2 are already using AI to create dynamic events. So those events aren't scripted? Nope. 
They're driven by AI that analyzes how players are behaving. That's amazing. So what can we expect in the future? Oh, the possibilities are endless. AI-powered NPCs that can hold real conversations. Wow. Game worlds that react to your every move. That's crazy. Even personalized storylines that change based on your choices. It sounds like the line between the virtual and real worlds is blurring. It is, in a way. It's both exciting and a little scary. I know what you mean. But it's definitely the future of gaming. There's no doubt about it. So we've talked about what the devs are doing. Pushing the boundaries with new tech and ideas. But I'm also curious about what the players are thinking. Oh yeah, what are they dreaming up? Remember that question we asked? About adding a feature to your favorite game? Uh-huh. We got some amazing responses from our listeners. Awesome. Some truly innovative ideas that could revolutionize gaming. I can't wait to hear them. Get ready to be inspired because we're diving into those game-changing ideas right. in the final part of our deep dive. Let's do it. And we're back for the final part of our deep dive into the world of multiplayer games. You've gone deep into the tech behind it all. The design choices, the challenges. Absolutely. And how those amazing experiences are created. And of course, how devs try to keep us glued to our screens. Exactly. But today, we're focusing on you, the players. The heart and soul of any game. You got it. Remember that question we asked? If you could add any feature to your favorite game, what would it be? Yeah, what's your dream feature? We got some incredible responses from our listeners. I bet. Always so much creativity out there. Truly game-changing ideas that could revolutionize how we play. I'm excited to hear them. Okay, so first up, someone suggested dynamic world events. Dynamic world events. Okay, I like where this is going. Imagine a game world where things like Natural disasters or invasions just happen. Whoa, like out of the blue. Totally. Transforming the environment and creating new challenges for players. That would be insane. You'd never know what to expect. Exactly. It would make the game world feel so much more alive. You'd have to adapt your strategies on the fly. And work together to overcome those obstacles. Players would be creating these amazing stories. Tales of surviving a volcano eruption or repelling an alien invasion. It would be epic. Right. It would give players a shared history. Like they were all part of something bigger. Exactly. Okay. Okay, next up we have cross-game progression. Cross-game progression. Interesting. Imagine your progress and achievements in one game carrying over to other games in the same universe. What, so like the stuff you earn in one game could give you a head start in another? That's the idea. That would be so cool. It would make playing all those games even more rewarding. Right. It would give you a reason to explore different parts of the franchise. Knowing that your efforts wouldn't go to waste? And just think of the gameplay possibilities. Like what? Imagine a character from a fantasy RPG suddenly appearing in a sci-fi shooter. Bringing their unique abilities and gear to a totally different setting? It would be wild. It would break down those walls between games. Creating this massive, interconnected universe. Man, the crossover events would be insane. I know, right? Okay, one more suggestion that I think you'll appreciate. Hit me with it. Player-driven economies. Player-driven economies. Now that's something I can get behind. Imagine a game where players have a real impact on the economy. Like they could create businesses and stuff? Exactly. Yeah. Trade goods, manipulate markets, just like in the real world. That's next level. Players would have to think about supply and demand. Competition, inflation, all that stuff. The game would become this giant economic simulation. It would be fascinating to see how players would shape these virtual economies. Form alliances, start trade wars, even create their own currencies. It would be like a giant social experiment. But in a virtual world. Exactly. It's amazing to see how much thought and creativity our listeners have. They really put a lot of effort into these ideas. It's inspiring to see that passion for pushing the boundaries of gaming. For sure. And it gives me hope for the future of multiplayer games. Me too. So that brings us to the end of our deep dive into multiplayer game development. We covered a lot of ground. From the technical nuts and bolts. To the design philosophy. And all those incredible possibilities that lie ahead. It's been an amazing journey. It really has. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And for sharing your awesome ideas. Remember, the world of gaming is constantly evolving, and there are no limits. Except your imagination. So keep playing, keep dreaming. And who knows, maybe one day we'll be talking about your game. Until then, game on. See ya.